I'm told that Professor Fisk is coming out of class, so she'll be joining us shortly. Um, and we're going to go and get started because Professor Chimerinsky has a plane that he has to catch later. Um, as y'all are all aware, President Bush recently nominated Judge Samuel Alito to sit on the United States Supreme Court. Um, several documents have come out recently indicating that Sam Alito is very pleasing to one ideology and very displeasing to another. Um, so here to talk about just what he believes and um, just what he would do to the Supreme Court if he were there is Professor Chimerinsky and Professor Fisk is going to be joining us shortly. It's really a pleasure to talk with you. Since 1987, when Lewis Powell resigned from the Supreme Court, Sandra Day O'Connor has been the swing vote in almost every controversial area. When you look at decisions concerning things like abortion rights, affirmative action, death penalty, federalism, separation of church and state, repeatedly there have been five four decisions with Sandra Day O'Connor in the majority. When Sandra Day O'Connor's placement was first named to be Harriet Myers, the right wing was truly outraged. They thought that this was their chance to have an ideologue appointed to bring about radical changes in constitutional law. Interestingly, Democrats almost entirely stayed quiet about Harriet Myers, and it was the right wing that really forced her to withdraw. President Bush then nominated Samuel Alito to replace O'Connor, and the right wing is truthfully, truly gleeful over this. They believe they have exactly the person they wanted when they were able to get Harriet Meyer's nomination withdrawn. What I want to suggest to you today is that in every major area, Samuel Alito would be a major change from Sandra Day O'Connor. We would likely shift the court protection of rights significantly to the right. The rights that all of you have taken for granted likely no longer exist with Samuel Alito on the Supreme Court. And I think I'm going to talk about several areas, take some questions, and then Catherine's going to talk about labor and employment decisions and take some questions. And I apologize that I have to leave a little bit early. I have a 2.15 flight to catch, but I think this format will give each of us about the same amount of time to talk and also give you the chance to ask questions. I think the easiest way to talk about what Samuel Alito would mean on the Supreme Court is by focusing on specifics rather than generalities. So let me go through a number of areas and tell you what he's written, and most importantly, how he'd be different from Sandra Day O'Connor. Let me do this in terms of areas alphabetically. Let me start with abortion rights. Sandra Day O'Connor has been the fifth vote in five four decisions to uphold abortion rights. So for example, in 1992, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision reaffirmed Roe versus Wade with Sandra Day O'Connor in the majority. The most recent Supreme Court decision about abortion was in the year 2000, Stenberg versus Carhartt, where the Supreme Court struck down a Nebraska law regulating abortion procedures. 5-4, Justice Breyer writing for the court, joined by Justice Stevens, Justice Souter, Justice Ginsburg, and Justice O'Connor. There is no doubt that Samuel Alito will be a vote to allow much more in the way of government regulation of abortion. And I think there's no doubt that he would be the vote, perhaps the fifth vote, to overrule Roe versus Wade. You can look at his decisions as a Third Circuit judge. For example, by coincidence, he participated in Planned Parenthood versus Casey when he was in the Third Circuit, and he voted to uphold the entirety of the statute, including voting to uphold a provision that would require married women to notify their husbands for getting an abortion. That case and that issue went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision reversed with Sandra Day O'Connor in the majority. On Monday of this week, a memo came out. Samuel Alito wrote it in 1985 to Ed Meese, who was applying for a position in the Justice Department. He said unequivocally that he believes that there is no constitutional right to abortion. That seems to indicate as clearly as anything can that he believes that Roe versus Wade was wrongly decided. Now on Tuesday he said, well, he was just applying for a job. 
does that mean he wasn't telling the truth? And if he wasn't telling the truth when he's applying for that job, why believe that he's telling the truth when he says when he's being considered for this job? There is absolutely nothing in Samuel Alito's record to suggest other than he's a strong foe for abortion rights. On the current court, there are two justices, Scalia and Thomas, who have repeatedly voted to overrule Roe v. Wade. John Roberts, when an attorney in the Justice Department, wrote briefs to the Supreme Court, urging them to overrule Roe v. Wade. Anthony Kennedy has been inconsistent. In 1989, in the first abortion case he participated in the Supreme Court, he voted to overrule Roe v. Wade, joining an opinion with Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice White, the only two dissenters in Roe v. Wade. In 1992, in Casey, Kennedy voted with the majority to affirm Roe, but in 2000, in Stenberg, he voted with dissenters, wrote a particularly vitriolic opinion. So at the very least, Alito would be the fifth vote to allow much more in the way of government regulation of abortion. But I think he also would be, when the situation presents itself, the fifth vote to overrule Roe versus Wade. Second area I'd point to is affirmative action. In June of 2003, in Grutter versus Bollinger, the Supreme Court voted five to four that colleges and universities have a compelling interest in having a diverse student body. And thus, college universities may use race as one factor in admission decisions to enhance diversity to benefit minorities. However, the opinion was written by Sandra Day O'Connor, joined by Justices Stephen Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer. If Samuel Alito takes a different view than O'Connor, that would then be the fifth vote to overrule Grutter. In the same memo in 1985, Samuel Alito wrote to Ed Meese that Alito was a strong opponent of quotas and using race as a basis for government decisions. That, of course, is language that unequivocally communicates that Alito believes that affirmative action is not constitutionally permissible. I have no doubt about what this would mean in practical terms. In California in 1996, adopted by voter initiative, a constitutional amendment to abolish affirmative action in the state in public education, contracting, and employment. We now have the statistics for the five years immediately after that, from 1997 to 2002. At the University of Southern California Law School, where Catherine and I both taught before coming here, it's a private university, 11.4% student body was African American. At Stanford Law School for these five years, also a private university, 9.6% of the student body was African American. At the University of California at Berkeley Bolt Hall School of Law, 3.2% of the student body was African American. And at UCLA Law School, 2.4% of the student body was African American. I taught, as did Catherine, several times at UCLA to help out. Teaching there in the spring of 2001, teaching federal courts and about 100 students in my class, there wasn't one black student in the room and only a few Latino students. My students would always ask me, what's the difference between USC and UCLA? I think it was sort of the Duke-UNC rivalry. And if you were there, they'd ask, what's the difference to Duke? And I said, the difference is there's no diversity here. There's not a single black student in the room. The woman who asked me the question said, well, I'm a third year about to graduate. And I've yet to be in any class in three years of law school who has an African-American student in the class. This year at UCLA Law School, there are 300 students in the entering class only four are African American. That will be the effect if Alito is confirmed to the court and cast as he's likely to the fifth vote to overrule Grutter. Third area that I would point to concerns the death penalty. In the summer of 2002, Sandra Day O'Connor gave a speech in which she expressed great concern about how the death penalty is administered in the United States. She pointed out that many people are convicted sentenced to death without adequate representation of attorneys. For instance, in Georgia, a person who has an appointed lawyer has a three time greater chance of getting a death sentence than a person who can afford to have an attorney. When George W. Bush was the governor of Texas, 150 individuals were executed. 50 of those, or about one third, had lawyers who had previously been disciplined by the bar for unethical activity. Sandra Day O'Connor, in a number of opinions, expressed this. And so, for example, in 2003, in a case called Wiggins versus Smith, O'Connor wrote the opinion for the court finding ineffective assistance counsel in a death penalty case. 
Well, there's a place where you can compare Alito and O'Connor. It's a case called Rimpilla versus Beard. It involved a man who was convicted and sentenced to death in Pennsylvania. The Third Circuit, in an opinion by Judge Alito, found that it was not ineffective assistance of counsel. Judge Alito's opinion said, the failure of the defense lawyer to go and read the file from the defendant's prior conviction was just a strategic choice by the lawyer. The Supreme Court, five to four, overruled Alito's opinion. And of course, the fifth vote for the majority was Justice O'Connor, joining with Justice Stevens, Souter, Justice Ginsburg, and Justice Breyer. The majority opinion pointed out that by not reading the file of the prior conviction, the lawyer didn't obtain key rebuttal evidence, and thus the court found ineffective assistance of counsel. Fourth area where Alito is likely to make a major change is with regard to federalism. As you know, if you've had con law, and if you haven't, you'll see next semester, that the area where the Rehnquist Court brought about the greatest changes in constitutional law was with regard to protecting states' rights in the name of federalism. Many of these cases were about narrowing Congress' ability to advance civil rights. Some of them were about narrowing Congress' ability to pursue desirable social objectives. Often, Justice O'Connor was the fifth vote for upholding federal laws. Again, I can compare Justice O'Connor and Judge Alito as to an issue where they both participated. It involved whether state governments could be sued for violating the Family and Medical Leave Act. This is a federal statute, as you may know, that says that employers have to give employees unpaid leave time, both for family care reasons and for medical care. Judge Alito participated in a decision that said that state governments cannot be sued for violating the Family and Medical Leave Act. The United States Supreme Court, when faced with the issue in another case, came to exactly the opposite conclusion. In a six to three decision, the Supreme Court said state governments can be sued providing the family leave provisions of the Family and Medical Leave Act. Justice O'Connor was one of the six in the majority, as was Chief Justice Rehnquist. And of course, if both are replaced by pro-states rights judges, anti-federal power judges, you can see a different outcome. Another case that I think is particularly revealing with regard to Judge Alito in federalism is a case called United States versus Rybar. This involves a federal law that prohibits the possession or transfer of machine guns. And the question is, does Congress have the power, as an aspect of its regulating commerce among the states, to prohibit possession or transfer of machine guns? The majority of the Third Circuit in a two to one decision held that machine guns are inherently items of interstate commerce. People don't make their own machine guns in their backyard. These are things that get made out of state, get shipped across state lines. Five other circuits around the country had considered the issue of the constitutionality of this law as an exercise of Congress commerce power. Every other circuit ruled that Congress had the constitutional authority to prohibit possession and transfer of machine guns. Third Circuit, in a 2-1 decision, came to the same conclusion as the other five circuits. But the one who dissented, who would have struck down the federal law, was Sam Alito. He takes a position that would very much limit federal power to achieve desirable social objectives, like regulating guns, but also to be able to advance civil rights. Fifth area that I would point to concerns privacy rights. The Supreme Court found that many aspects of privacy are protected under the Constitution, including under the Fourth Amendment with regard to search and seizure, including under the 14th Amendment under the Due Process Clause. I already mentioned abortion, which is an aspect of privacy. But there are some decisions of Judge Alito that are particularly troubling with regard to privacy outside the abortion context. Let me mention one, and there are others I could talk about, a case called Doe versus Grudy. Police went to execute a search warrant at a house. The individual they were looking for was a man. There was, at the time they went to execute the search warrant, a woman and her 10-year-old daughter. The woman wasn't named in the search warrant. She wasn't suspected of anything. And obviously, the 10-year-old wasn't suspected of anything either. Nonetheless, the police detained the woman and the 10-year-old, strip searched the woman and the 10-year-old. Hard to imagine much more degrading that police can do to somebody than subject them to a strip search. And that's what the court did here 
to the woman and the 10-year-old daughter. Well, not surprisingly, the woman and the 10-year-old sue the police officers. The Third Circuit rule, two to one, in favor of the woman and the 10-year-old, that the police officers here violated the Fourth Amendment, that they violated clearly established law that the reasonable officer should know. The one judge who dissented, who would have not found liability for the police officers, was Samuel Alito. And it's part of so many cases where he voted in favor of the police, even when there's outrageous behavior. Sixth and final area that I talk about is separation of church and state. For decades, especially for over a half century, the Supreme Court has said that there's a wall that separates church and state, that the government violates that wall if it acts with the purpose of advancing religion, or if the effect of the government's action to advance religion, or if there's excess of government entangled with religion. There have been four justices on the court who wanted to overrule that who believe there's not a wall that separates church and state, who believes that government should accommodate religion. On the court recently, they've been Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas. By their view, the government violates the Establishment Clause only if it literally establishes a church or coerces religious participation. By their view, the government can put religious symbols anywhere it wants on government property. The government can give any aid to parochial schools so long as it doesn't discriminate among religions. The fifth vote rejecting that position has been Sandra Day O'Connor. So for example, on June 27th of this year, the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional a county in Kentucky's Ten Commandments display. The county in Kentucky adopted a resolution declaring that we're a Christian nation, and as part of that, wanting the Ten Commandments posted in county buildings. It shouldn't surprise you that the American Civil Liberties Union brought a challenge against this. The county then adopted other resolutions. One praised Chief Justice Roy Moore in Alabama. Another of them said everywhere the Ten Commandments is posted, there'd be nine other displays, all of the same size and framing, with things about the role of religion in American history. One display was the words, in God we trust. Another had the religious words in the Declaration of Independence. The Supreme Court, five to four, declared that unconstitutional. Justice Souter wrote for the court, joined by Justice Stevens, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Breyer, and Justice O'Connor. The four dissenting justices, Rehnquist, Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas, left no doubt that they would allow that or any religious symbol on government property. Well, John Roberts, when he was in the Justice Department, wrote a brief to the Supreme Court, urged them to overrule the law that had provided for separation of church and state, urging them to take the position that the government violates the Establishment Clause only to literally establish a church or coerces religious participation. So where Alito is is going to be key. In case after case, as a judge on the Third Circuit, he has voted in favor of allowing government support for religion and religious presence in government. So for example, the Third Circuit considered the issue of whether student-delivered prayers at public school graduations violate the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. The Supreme Court, a case called Lee versus Weissman in 1992, held that clergy delivered prayers at public school graduations violate the Establishment Clause. The majority of the Third Circuit, like the Ninth Circuit and other circuits, said it doesn't matter whether it's clergy or student, prayers, graduations are impermissible. In fact, the Supreme Court even said that student delivered prayers at high school football games violate the Establishment Clause. The decision of the Third Circuit was 2-1, with Judge Alito being willing to vote to allow it. Judge Alito is participating in cases involving religious symbols on government property. Over and again, he's voted to allow the religious symbols on government property, leaving no doubt that he would be the fifth vote to change the law, the fifth vote to literally obliterate the wall that separates church and state. I've picked these six areas. Catherine's going to talk about labor and employment decisions in a few minutes. But I have no doubt, having now read probably a couple of hundred Alito decisions, that there's a reason why the far right is so gleeful. If you look at all of the justices on the current court, the justice who Samuel Alito is going to be most like is Antonin Scalia. He is going to be the fifth vote to overrule so many precedents that have protected civil rights and civil liberties. That's why I think it's so essential that moderate, that uh, if it's Judge Alito, we can hear his rebuttal. <laughs> 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 My hope is that moderate Republicans will join with Democrats 
in voting against Samuel Alito. Some moderate Republicans, like Snow and Chafee, have already expressed great concern about him. If not, then I think that it's essential that the Democrats filibuster against Alito. That when the filibuster was preserved in June of this year, it was an agreement there would only be extraordinary circumstances. If these aren't extraordinary circumstances, then I don't know what is. There's, of course, then the danger that Republicans would try to eliminate the filibuster. So I'm hopeful that even if moderate Republicans were willing to vote in favor of Alito, they wouldn't join in an effort to eliminate the filibuster. But I think if this is going to happen, if Alito is going to be blocked, which I regard as so essential, it's going to be because people are effective in communicating to their senators that this has to happen. I think it's so essential for all of us to find a way to communicate to senators, especially the moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats, how important we think this is. It's so important that any organizations that we're involved in get involved here. Um, I ask you, and I'll do this by way of conclusion, to think about why was it that Robert Bork was defeated in 1987, but Clarence Thomas was confirmed in 1991. It's not that Thomas is different in any area from what Bork would be. It wasn't about ideology. The reason is there were six senators who voted against Bork who voted in favor of Thomas. And I could name them for you, the people like Sam Nunn and David Boren and so on. And it was clear, if you look back on it, that the constituent pressure that developed against Bork never successfully developed against Clarence Thomas. And if you share my view that Alito is such a threat to civil rights and civil liberties, we have to make sure that this is much more the Bork situation than the Thomas situation. And it is, I think, the responsibility of all of us, those we know, the organizations we're involved in, to let our voices be heard here. And so I think what I'll do, if it's OK, is I, I, before you came in, we said we would take 30 minutes each. And so I could take a few minutes of questions and then leave you the last half hour. And well, I want to leave you lots of time. So, <laughs> But questions about anything that I said or other areas that I didn't find besides labor and employment? Please. Do you really think there is any point in writing to the North Carolina senators? Yes, and I'll tell you why. I think that they're going to both vote in favor of Alito. But I don't necessarily know how they're going to vote when it comes to the question of eliminating the filibuster. That the filibuster has existed since the very first Congress. The first filibuster occurred over the location of the District of Columbia. Sitting here is the leading expert in the country on the history of the filibuster. Um, and I think it would be an extraordinary step for the Senate, in the middle of considering a nominee, to vote to change the Senate rules to eliminate the filibuster. And I don't know if it came to that how even the North Carolina senators, served as they are, would vote on that. But there's no reason you have to be limited to just the North Carolina senators. Most of you are not from North Carolina. So you could certainly write to your home senators. But even if you're from North Carolina, or even if your home senators are sure votes one way or the other, you can write to senators from other states. Often I understand what Senate offices do is simply count up the number of calls or messages that they get on each side. So I think for that reason, it's important to be heard. And as I alluded to, I think it's so important to get organizations involved and have <coughs> them clearly state, too much is at stake for this nomination to let it just go through. Please. Could you also talk about, a little bit about the conflict of interest of uh, Justice Alito? Yeah. Um, when, this is a question about conflict of interest. When Judge Alito was up for confirmation, he said that there were a couple of companies where he wouldn't participate in decisions if they were involved in cases. Turns out, notwithstanding that promise, he did participate in a case involving them. I don't know how serious the conflict of interest is. It's gotten some media attention, not a lot of media attention. The reason it might get more attention than it was would is in 1968, Abe Fortas, who was a justice on the Supreme Court, was nominated to be chief justice. He was blocked by a filibuster. The filibuster had nothing to do with conflict of interest. Like the conflict of interest allegations against Fortas had not even been revealed at the time of the filibuster. Um, Senator Strom Thurmond from South Carolina led the filibuster against Fortas, against another individual, Homer Thornberry, on the grounds that a lame duck president should not be nominating justice to the Supreme Court. And so I've often been asked, well, has there ever been a filibuster for a justice for the Supreme Court? And the answer is yes. It occurred with regard to Fortas and Thornberry. After the filibuster was successful, 
And after President Nixon appointed individuals to replace Chief Justice Warren and then for the vacancy, um, ethical violations by Fortas came out in terms of conflict of interest. And as a result of those charges, Fortas resigned from the United States Supreme Court. And so I think it's going to be necessary to learn a lot more about Alito's participation in the case where he said he would never participate with that particular party being involved. But we don't know a lot more than that. Um, one defense that's already been made about Judge Alito is that there's a difference between the, the sort of positions he would take as an appellate court justice, sort of interpreting Supreme Court precedent, and his role, sort of, if you're on the Supreme Court, sort of making that precedent. I've already heard that sort of as a defense put up in response to some of the things you've been articulating. I'm curious, first, if that's something that's been a defense that's been used in the past, whether you think that that has actually ended up having any significance for previous nominees. Um, and also, I'm just curious, it's my impression of Judge Alito that although he's undoubtedly sort of uh, <coughs> ideologically conservative, he also seems a lot more sort of uh, conservative in judicial temperament than some of the other justices that are currently on the court. And I'm wondering if you think that that has any significance in sort of how he takes the direction of the court. <coughs> Let me start by saying implicit and what I said this afternoon is that I think that the ideology of a person matters in terms of whether or not he or she should be confirmed by the Supreme Court. Throughout American history, presidents have picked individuals to be on the Supreme Court and the federal courts based on their ideology. George Bush didn't look at all the federal court of appeals judges in the country and say, I think Samuel Alito is the smartest. He was looking for somebody who was of the same ideology. Likewise, throughout American history, the Senate has looked at ideology. And so when George Washington picked John Rutledge to be the second Chief Justice of the United States, and John Rutledge had just been confirmed as Associate Justice, the Senate blocked him. Rutledge in the interim had said things about the United States being a neutral concerning the war between England and France that the Senate didn't like. And the Senate refused to confirm John Rutledge to be the second Chief Justice because they didn't like his views. Over the course of the 19th century, over 20% of presidential picks for the Supreme Court were rejected by the Senate, almost all based on ideology. In the 20th century, over 10% of presidential picks for the Supreme Court were rejected, almost all because of ideology. John Parker in 1931, Clement Hainsworth and Harold Carswell in 1969, Robert Bork in 1987 were all rejected based on ideology. And of course, the reason for this is the views of a person determine how he or she is going to vote and be cased on the Supreme Court. Justices have tremendous discretion in interpreting the broad language of the Constitution. Just have tremendous discretion in deciding what's a compelling or an important or a legitimate government interest. And the views that somebody brings determine how he or she is going to vote. So we need to know what those views are. We know that Samuel Alito isn't going to say before the Senate Judiciary Committee that he's going to vote to overrule Roe versus Wade. Even if he was 100% committed to doing that, he's not going to say. He's also not going to say he's going to vote to affirm Roe versus Wade. What he's going to say is, I can't answer questions about matters that are going to come before me. So if we believe that ideology matters, and if we know that we're not going to learn ideology from answers at the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings, there have to be other ways to know ideology. I think what he did as a Court of Appeals judge is revealing of that. I think that for those who have written law review articles, memos, it's revealing of that. I think what you write in a job application is revealing of that. But I think you've got to assume that when somebody's applying for a job, they're telling the truth. As I said, otherwise you couldn't believe anything he's saying now when he's being considered for the Supreme Court. And when he said in his application that he thinks that it was wrong for the Supreme Court to protect abortion rights, you have to assume that's what he believes. Because otherwise we have no basis for assessing ideology. And I'm not willing to accept that. Um, I think the simple question would be, Mr. Toledo, can you point to anything in your record that would suggest you wouldn't be the fifth vote to overrule Robert Swade? Can you put anything in your record that would suggest you wouldn't be the fifth vote to overrule Grutter versus Bollinger and so on? I think the answer to that is no. When every imaginable scrap of evidence points in one direction, I don't think we can get somebody out of it by saying, well, but I was just saying that. So that's why I think that the opinions are revealing. You talked about the vote a lot, and I feel like in a lot of those that Justice Kennedy is already counted as the fourth vote. And do you think that, like, it'll change over time, that in the past he's been comfortable being the fourth vote in the dissent since Justice O'Connor was in the majority, but that if Judge Alito is confirmed, like, 
he'll be less comfortable, he can <coughs> overrule it, so he'll switch. Political scientists have created this notion of the median justice. And Justice O'Connor in so many areas has been the median justice. In some areas, Justice Kennedy has been the median justice. And so, for example, this past year when the Supreme Court struck down the death penalty for crimes committed by juveniles, it was 5-4 with Kennedy joining Stephen Souter Ginsburg and Breyer. In the takings case that got so much media attention this year, it was Kennedy is the fifth vote. But there are some areas where Kennedy is much more conservative than O'Connor. So Kennedy being the median justice rather than O'Connor will really make a difference. And those are the areas that I talked about. There's no doubt that Kennedy is more conservative with regard to abortion than O'Connor. He's always been more conservative. And I don't think there's any likelihood he's going to become more liberal just because O'Connor has gone from the court. Affirmative action. Kennedy, in every affirmative action case, has voted against affirmative action programs, whereas O'Connor at times has voted to uphold them, such as in Grutter and other cases I can show you. I don't think Kennedy's going to change his views on that. Separation of church and state. Kennedy has been a strong advocate ever since coming on the court that the court should only strike down things that violate the Establishment Clause if the government coerces religious participation. Kennedy's not going to abandon that position just because O'Connor is no longer on the court. So I think it's especially in these areas that if you shift from O'Connor to Kennedy being the median justice, you really change the law. One more question, and then I'll let Catherine take over. So if, um, if not Sam Alito, but someone still from what we would consider George Bush's short list, um, is there someone you would prefer and, and why? Sure. Obviously, George Bush is going to pick a Republican, and that's his prerogative. However, I think what the Senate needs to say to George Bush is, we want a justice who's like O'Connor, who really reflects the mainstream and isn't as far to the right as a Scalia or a Thomas as Alito is. You ask me, who could it be? Allison Duncan is a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, appointed by President Bush in his first term, a Republican, but much more like O'Connor. Rena Raji is a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, um, appointed by President Bush to the Second Circuit in his first term. Again, much more like O'Connor than like Scalia. Harris Hartz, a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. Again, appointed by Bush in his first term. You can look at state Supreme Courts. Joyce Kennard is on the California Supreme Court. A Republican, appointed by a Republican governor to the California Supreme Court. But again, more in the O'Connor mold. Now, I think if the Democrats and moderate Republicans are successful in blocking Alito, they have to be in it for the long haul. President Bush would then come back with Michael Ludig or Edith Jones. They have to say, no, that's unacceptable. But I think the question is, will President Bush pick a moderate conservative to essentially keep the law in all of these areas about where it was? Or will President Bush be able to get someone like Alito on, who's really at the far right of the political spectrum and radically change the law in all these areas? And so what's at stake is our rights in so many different areas of constitutional and statutory law. Why don't I turn it over to you, and I'm going to listen for a few minutes, and then... I'm happy to cede the time to my, to my distinguished colleague if there are more questions. <laughs> Sorry, I was teaching all noon, and uh, the material is a little confusing, so... I didn't quite get all my questions answered. Um, so um, I guess I'm here to provide ideological balance on this panel or something. <laughs> um, what I want to talk about that could add value to what Erwin already said with respect to this is, um, first of all, talking about an area of law that's primarily statutory as opposed to constitutional where judges um, may be constrained a little bit more by choices that Congress made in drafting statutes um, and also address some of the other issues that that Judge Alito uh, or that people have made about Judge Alito. Um, first of all, you know, if you're interested in his collected works on labor and employment law, here they are. There's a fair number of them, a lot of cases. Um, I have looked at all of them, and he, uh, these are cases that he wrote, and then there are a lot more where he joined. Um, rules for the employer, or votes for the employer, about two-thirds of the time, but not 100% of the time. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is focus on some of the qualitative issues about his work. 
you know, a lot of these issues are highly technical questions about, you know, eligibility for compensation under the Black Lung Benefits Act, which is a workers' comp system for coal miners, essentially. Um, what you see in Judge Alito's work is that he's very, very careful in his work. It's undisputed that he's very smart. He works very hard. He writes clearly. Um, he, you know, but that doesn't mean necessarily that he ought to be confirmed. The courts are full of smart, conscientious, hardworking people at various points on the ideological spectrum. And I, I don't actually agree with Irwin on everything, but I do agree with him that ideology should be the focus, not whether he's a nice guy. By all accounts, he's a very nice guy. Uh, whether he's smart, clearly smart. Um, what you see in his opinions that is different from Justice Scalia in particular, yes, he disagrees. <laughs> um, um, is that, and I actually think it's going to make him more effective than Justice Scalia has ever been in marshalling swing votes, is that he, as his personal views, tend not to come forward in his opinions. He writes opinions without ever using the first person singular. He writes opinions that are a little drier than Justice Scalia's opinions. If you read Scalia opinions, Posner opinions, Judge Easterbrook opinions, uh, Judge Kaczynski on the Ninth Circuit are among some of the, the prominent uh, conservative judges that you might compare to. They tend to uh, talk pithily about law and talk fairly freely about policy, about common sense, um, a very personal style in their writing. And they're not shy about calling other arguments silly, unprincipled, um, or worse. Justice Scalia, as is well known, might have been much more influential in persuading. I mean, this is all speculation. But many people think he would have been much more influential in persuading Justice O'Connor in particular to join his point of view if he had not particularly early in uh, their time on the court said fairly nasty things personally in print about her writing or her position in cases and calling it you know, stupid or unprincipled or whatever. You'll never see Scalia do, uh, sorry, um, Alito do that. And I think that's going to make him much more persuasive in areas where there is space to move in the law. I think in the labor and employment area, he is going to be reliably um, that conservative, voting for the employer, for narrow interpretations of civil rights statutes or other employment law statutes. And I offer a number of examples for this. Um, not only the sum total of his votes, but the places in a number of controversial cases where he has either written a majority opinion narrowing the law or, and this is very significant, written a concurring opinion or a dissenting opinion suggesting that the court has not gone far enough um, or reached the wrong decision in the case of a dissent. Um, so, and what this suggests to me is a desire to be influential in changing the law. Court of Appeals judges are very strategic about when they will concur separately and when they will dissent because their colleagues on the court take it as a slap to lose a vote or to not get somebody to join the opinion. Concurring opinions and dissenting opinions are therefore almost always written symbolically for the purpose of either urging other colleagues on the court who aren't on the three-judge panel to urge the court as a whole to take the case on banc, or to urge one of the parties to ask for on banc consideration, or to urge the Supreme Court to take a case. And Judge Alito writes concurring and dissenting opinions quite often. So one example of this that I think makes the point fairly clearly was actually a case having to do with the admissibility of evidence in a discrimination case. The employer had sought to use some evidence about what an employee had said in the past to show the absence of discrimination. Um, 
The employee said, well, if you're going to use that statement, then I want to prove that the context in which I made that statement was responding to prior incidents of discrimination against me. The trial judge excluded the evidence on the ground that that would open up a whole past history of discrimination against this guy that was out of the statute of limitations period for which the employee could sue, and thus wasn't relevant. And so the judge said, look, I'll allow the employer to use this part of the statements, but I won't allow the employee to rebut the evidence with respect to this part of the statements. Evidentiary rulings are reviewed in the Court of Appeals for an abuse of discretion. Very deferential standard. Courts seldom overturn trial judges' evidentiary rulings. In this case, the Court of Appeals did overturn the trial judge's evidentiary ruling, finding that it was an abuse of discretion because the selective use of evidence was so unfair. You know, the trial judge might have been right, the Court of Appeals might have been right, you could, uh, reasonable minds could differ on that. What's significant is that Judge Alito dissented from the court's ruling on this evidentiary issue. This is not a big issue of precedent. This just isn't one of those giant cases in which you would expect courts to try and articulate the contrary view of the law. But what he was clearly trying to do was prompt rehearing on bunk on the, on the argument that you know this evidentiary ruling was just wrong by the Court of Appeals. But that suggests to me a certain ambition in the way that he's going to try and persuade colleagues. Um, you know, that said, it is clear that he will follow established case law at, when it's well settled. So for example, the uh, Third Circuit had a case in which Walmart had argued uh, that end stage kidney disease, which is fatal if you don't continue on dialysis and get a transplant, is not a disability within the meaning of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Walmart's argument was um, this doesn't impair any major life activity, which is the technical definition of what a disability is. Um, Walmart's argument also was you have to consider him in his corrected state. And thus, you know, because he's getting dialysis, he can live. Whereas if he weren't getting dialysis, he would die. But since he's getting dialysis, he can function. And therefore, he's also not disabled. That position has been pretty clearly rejected by the Supreme Court in a case called Abbott versus Bragdon about whether HIV is a disability. Being HIV positive or having AIDS doesn't disable your ability to do much of anything. But the Supreme Court said, well, it still counts as a disability and therefore discriminating because somebody's HIV positive or has AIDS um, is unlawful because it, it interferes with your major life activity of reproduction was the rationale that the court reached. It's one of the few cases that the Supreme Court has ruled in an Americans with Disabilities Act case in favor of the plaintiff. Typically, they have ruled for the employer and arguably, therefore, narrow the statute. So the Third Circuit with Judge Alito said, all right, if AIDS is a disability, end stage kidney disease has to be a disability too, even though it doesn't actually interfere with your ability to do anything except live. The way the opinion was written, though, suggests that absent this precedent, they might have a different view. And so I think the, the real question is, on these statutory cases, you know, I don't think there are five votes to overrule Abbott versus Bragdon, in part because in statutory areas, precedent uh, often counts for a little more. They'll narrow a little bit, but they won't overturn a decision in a radical way. They'll say, if Congress has got a problem with it, Congress will change it, which obviously Congress can't do in the constitutional area. So consistently across the board in his decisions, you find cautious, narrowing, um, conservative interpretations of statutes any place there is room to move. You don't find very much you know, completely radical, sort of this whole thing doesn't make any sense. We should abandon it because Congress hasn't gotten around to it. I don't think you're going to see that in Alito, even on the Supreme Court in statutory areas. But what you will see is every place there's room to move, there will be movement in the area towards a narrow interpretation of labor and employment legislation rather than a more expansive interpretation. 
And what will then happen in the law really is going to depend on Congress's willingness to respond to narrow interpretations of protective labor and employment statutes. Congress, in a democratic Congress, has done that in the past. In the 1988-89 term at the Supreme Court, they decided six civil rights cases interpreting Title VII and other uh, civil rights employment statutes that were conservative interpretations. In some cases, they had overturned prior interpretations by the court. In most cases, they just chose the more conservative view. And in 1991, Congress legislatively all overturned all of those. But it's going to have to be, and I think, I think Alito is aware of that and aware of the risk of sort of statutory overreaching by the court. On the other hand, it takes something fairly radical to prompt Congress to react because the status quo is very hard to change legislatively. There's just too much on Congress's agenda for them to really do a lot. So I think that you will find sort of steady narrowing every place that it can be narrowed. And that will matter a lot in disability discrimination, where the court has overwhelmingly ruled for employers constantly narrowing who's entitled to protection of the statute. It will matter if the court decides to step back into the question of whether Title VII will allow affirmative action, which is a separate question from whether the Constitution does, although they'll probably come out the same way, and it's an issue that the court has stayed away from for uh, over 10 years. Um, it will matter in other areas where they have to reconcile what might be competing policies with respect to, for example, who's eligible for overtime protection under the federal wage and hour law. Um, so I think the ideology is clear in his lower court decisions. And what convinces me that he is perhaps even more seriously a menace to my personal set of values about what I think the law will look like is I think he's going to be way more effective than Scalia and Thomas. In, and this goes to your point about Kennedy in marshalling the votes of the moderate justices. Questions? I remember reading about an opinion, um, which the name of which escapes me, where the uh, the majority accused him of a very radical interpretation of Title VII. Um, as the majority represented his viewpoint, it would mean that essentially so long as an employer could demonstrate a good faith belief that they had hired the best person, even if they in good faith believed that all people with a certain skin color were unqualified, that that would satisfy Title VII. Was the majority accurate in representing Alito's view as, as being as much? And if so, would there still be a Title VII if, uh, if, if that became the law? Yeah, this um, goes to the question of what the plaintiff has to prove in order to prove that an employer's sort of articulated reason for hiring an employee is a pretext for discrimination, which is what the plaintiff has to prove in order to prevail. And I think that what the majority's criticism of Alito's position was is that unless the plaintiff can come up with really smoking gun evidence that, you know, for example, there was a case in the Tenth Circuit written by Judge Harris Hartz, actually, in which Walmart had said to an employee returning from a leave in which he'd had brain tumors removed by surgery, the employer said to the employee's wife, um, you know, we don't think mentally he's capable of being the night maintenance manager anymore. And uh, so we're going to demote him back to just doing maintenance. It, it, the employer lost. Um, and, you know, not a surprise, right? But it's rare that you have a supervisory employee coming right out and saying, we're not going to hire you because we just don't think you have the mental ability to do it. Um, and so, Almost every discrimination case is a case in which you have to make an inference from circumstantial evidence about what the employer's motives were. Now, the lower courts have created over the years a number of heightened standards to try and make it much harder for plaintiffs to offer evidence to make the inference. And the Supreme Court, at least at the summary judgment stage or the pleading stage, has said, no, you cannot create these heightened standards. Juries can find the issue of discrimination on, 
by a preponderance of the evidence in this case like any other. So I don't think that that would cause a radical change in Title VII law because I think the court has simply said, let's treat these as evidence cases. Um, but what it does suggest to me is sort of at the general question of policy, whether you, and I think there's no way to interpret Title VII without essentially going to the question of how often do you think it is that discrimination really occurs in our society? There's too much of the law that's all about disputes about whether this is a serious social problem that the law needs to address, or whether instead Title VII has become the last refuge of the ne'er-do-well employee who gets fired for good reasons, but then has a lawsuit, brings a lawsuit simply because he can say, well, you know, it was my race, or it was my gender, or my religion, or something like that. Um, and so I think in that sense, your, your default view about whether this is a problem is going to influence interpretive questions, whether it's under the Title VII area where they've done a lot of cases lately, and I doubt there's going to be the votes to do anything terribly radical, except possibly in the sexual harassment area where I think there's some real change that could happen, but also in the other statutory discrimination cases like the Americans with Disabilities Act where there could still be quite a bit of movement. Okay. If other questions occur to you, shoot me or Erwin an email. We'd be happy to, uh, to answer them. Take care. <laughs>